Galatians chapter 1. Last week I showed you this up on the screen. That's Kenneth Copeland getting a little bit upset over somebody question. How dare anybody question him? So Steve Gelt sent me this this week. He's the joker. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it works. I mean, it works pretty good. So, Galatians chapter 1. We were talking about those who perverted the gospel. And uh, here a while back, I, I did a, a video on this subject. And I talked about the difference between the real gospel and all of these substitutes that pretend to be the real gospel. And I, and I sort of illustrated it like this. So let's say there was a guy and he had a hot dog stand and he sold hot dogs. But they're real expensive hot dogs. But he made all these claims that these hot dogs would give you healing, it would, it would clear out all your sins, all your lust, it would, and it would, draw you, it would make you close to God if you ate this hot dog. Hot dog costs $20. So, and it's the same hot dog anybody else would sell, but the guy hypes it up. You know how people do. And he tells everybody, if you eat this hot dog, you'll be close to God, God will love you, it's, God wants you to eat this hot dog, and God will forgive all your sins, but you got to do this, and you got to do it every week. you got to come back every week. So he's, what he's doing, he's making repeat customers. And this guy's raking in a fortune, because he's got everybody convinced that they have to eat this hot dog, and they have to pay this much money, and they have to keep doing it, and if they stop, then all their forgiveness goes, and it's out, and it's gone. So then, and he's got a, got a long, he's got a good business going, okay? So anyway, a billionaire. Guy's made his fortune, doesn't have any need in the world, wants to give back. So he opens up a hot dog stand on the other side, on the other corner, across the street. Same hot dog. Only his is free. Absolutely free. Because he's got money and he wants to give back to everybody. And he just always, you know, always wanted to have a hot dog stand. But he made his fortune in something else. And now he's, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he's got this hot dog stand. And he's giving away hot dogs for free. And he's right across the street from the guy that convinced everybody they needed his hot dog and they're paying $20 a week for it, all right? So, now the guy who's selling the hot dogs notices that people are not showing up to his hot dog stand because he can see them going across the street to that guy's stand over there. Because that, and that guy is giving away, I mean, you can't compete with a guy who's giving away what you're selling, right? Can't compete. And I got, I got a story. Michael told me something this morning. So anyway, he sees all the business going over there, and the rich billionaire is just giving away hot dogs for free, okay? As many as they want. As many as they want. And he says, if you like this hot dog, come back tomorrow. I'll give you another one absolutely free. So the guy who's selling the hot dogs is, doesn't like the guy who's giving them away. So he's going to start a campaign against the guy who's giving away hot dogs. Right? So he starts lying to everybody. And he tells them, if you eat that guy's, now it's the same hot dog. 
But he says, if you go to that guy's hot dog stand, you're going to die and go to hell. If you eat his hot dog, you're doomed. God's going to hate you. In fact, God has told me, God told me in a vision last night to warn everybody not to go to that hot dog stand. So he starts that kind of stuff. And he gets some people following him. The guy selling hot, or guy giving away hot dogs, he don't care. He's just giving away hot dogs. So the guy, the guy selling hot dogs realizes that's not working well enough. So he gets the city people in on it. He gets the city, he gets, calls the health inspector and says, that guy's not washing his hands, he's not following safety protocols and this and that. And so he gets the safety people down on him and he gets the city administrators down on him and they're doing everything they can. But this guy, I mean, he's a very powerful man, right? He's a rich billionaire and he's a very powerful man and he can, you know, he, that stuff doesn't phase him at all. So he's still giving away the hot dogs. The guy selling the hot dogs and now is furious and so i mean he launches in a smear campaign he starts doing underhanded tactics you know one night he'll go and send somebody to burn the guy's hot dog stand down well the guy shows up next day with a brand new hot dog stand he's a billionaire he can afford this and it just all of this going on every day okay so then you know the guy he's going to get mean and nasty and so he starts going to the city leaders and he starts going to police chief and he's got all these guys in his pocket. And then, you know, he lobs against a Trump, bunch of trumped up charges against the guy giving away free hot dogs. You understand where I'm going with this. I mean, everything the guy can do to destroy the man who's giving away the free hot dogs. Okay? And that's what, that's the difference in all of the religions in the world. There is a religion that gives the gospel away absolutely free. No cost, no payment. In fact, turn to Isaiah 55. I'll show you this. Isaiah 50, I'm thinking of verses, Ephesians 2, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, why would God, why would God make you pay for something that he's already paid for? Salvation has already been paid for. The atonement has already been purchased. And it's been purchased with the blood of God's Son. So why would God make you earn something that's already been earned? It would be like if you went to work, Brian, and you worked all week and you stuck your hand out to your boss and said, I need my check. Well, we want you to work double for the same money. Does that set well with you? Nope. Okay. But that's what they do. So why earn, why earn something that's already been earned? Why buy something that's already been paid for? Why not accept the free gift instead of paying for it or doing something to earn it? So Isaiah 55, verse 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, who is that? That's us. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Not poor in flesh, poor in spirit. And what that means is we are spiritually bankrupt. We have a debt that we owe and it's a debt against our sin it's a debt that we accumulated we did the deeds so we owe the debt you know when somebody goes to prison they say they're paying their debt to society they owe a debt it's their prison sentence they're gonna have to they're gonna have to go and do the time the that's what the law says law has to be the law has to be fulfilled so he says he that hath no money that's us we can't pay the debt Come ye, buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wine is the Holy Spirit, milk is the milk of the Word of God. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, or your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, come unto me, and hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David." Did God ever have to have mercy with David? 
Did God ever have to forgive David of something he did wrong? Absolutely. David committed adultery with another man's wife, one of his own captain's wives. Then to cover up the pregnancy, he brought the guy in. When the guy wouldn't go to home to his wife, David put him on the front line, had him murdered. God forgave David of that. Absolutely free. So, back in Galatians. Um, he says in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. Which is not another. It's not. It's not the same contract if one contract says you pay for it and another contract says you don't pay for it. It's not the same contract. It's not the same gospel. And it's not a gospel. It's not good news. It's not good tidings to tell people they must earn salvation. It is good tidings to tell people that since they can't earn salvation, don't worry about it. It's already been earned. The price has already been paid. The debt has already been cleared. So why do that? Why call it a gospel? Because that's not what it is. Which is not another, but there'd be some to trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's what I was talking about. The hot dog stand where the guy sells it for 20 bucks. You got to come back every week and you've, and you, if you don't eat it, if you miss out one time, you're going to hell. So he says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Paul's serious about this and so am I. Michael tells me this morning he's been dealing with something ever since he left Kenya. In Turkana, our radio station is in an office building and it's, you know, behind the, everything out there is behind a big iron gate for security. All the doors are iron, all the buildings are concrete or, or big block, so you just can't kick your way in. And so we have an office building where our radio station is in Turkana. We have a contract for that office building. We pay rent and we signed a rental agreement with the landowner. That actually, the landlord is an American guy. So we signed a lease agreement with him and we have a contract. Guess what? An organization called Mary's Meals. Yep, the Vatican, an organization called Mary's Meals is buying out all the office space in that building. On the floor below us and on both sides. And they're pressuring to get us put out so they can have our office. They're trying to get us put out. That's, that's what I'm telling you. The guy who's selling the hot dogs tries everything he can to get the guy who's giving away the hot dogs to stop giving them away. Because we were made an offer to buy out our radio station by the Catholic Church. They first tried to buy us out. That's what Michael told me. And I, and I did what you did. I went, nope. And then I said, how much? I don't want to tell you. They offered us a large amount of money to buy us out. Okay, and I'm glad I said no before I heard the amount. But no. Okay. So they can't buy us out. And if you, I've been to that area. The Catholic Church does not need that office building. They got stuff all over town. But they're targeted our radio station. And they're going to try to get us thrown out. Okay? So they got the... And let me tell you something. The Catholic Church is the largest organized crime organization in the universe. Every Italian mafia group they're all Catholic. And they all have a priest involved in their stuff. 
you don't believe that, I'm sorry, but I'm telling you that's how it is. Okay? I know a story told to me by a family in this church who has a relative who is involved in the St. Louis Mafia where a Catholic priest was involved in it. I know the story. Okay? So they are the largest mafia organization in the universe. And they don't play nice. They play dirty. So they're going to try to get us thrown out. They've, they've tried. They've, Michael said that they, after we started a radio station there and called it Watchman FM, they started a radio station called it Watchman FM. But it cost them 800 grand to do it. It didn't cost us near that much, thank God. Nowhere near that. But that's the money they spent just to get a competing radio station in where we are. Hot dog stand, hot dog stand. Okay? And everything about Catholic doctrine is exactly what Paul's saying here. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, here's where I'm at with this. If God wants us over there, we're over there. If God says pull up, he'll let them take over. I mean, they're God's people. God knows them. And if God wants to turn them over to all that stuff, then he can do it. Okay? He is sovereign. But as long as God wants us to have that radio station there and keep doing what we're doing, then, it, then the gates of hell itself cannot prevail against it. Okay? So just pray. You know, pray for God's will. Pray that God will... I, I'm, listen. The outpour of satanic activity that has taken place since Michael got on a plane, I have not seen in years. I've seen it, but I've not seen it in years. And I'm telling you, it's devil's pulled out everything he can do all right so anyway uh last week we talked a little bit about uh we got into the mormon church the angel moroni according to joe smith was sent down from heaven in 1830 1823 somewhere around in there this is from a mormon website this is from their official website so um, they said that the angel Moroni came down, told Joseph Smith where there were some secret golden plates buried in the hills of upstate New York. These golden plates written in uh, reformed hieroglyphics, which nobody's ever heard of before, ever, or since. And that Joseph Smith would need these special glasses that he called the Urim and the Thummim in order to read the hieroglyphics. Joseph Smith would read the hieroglyphics. He would write down what it was translated out to be in English. And that's his story of how he ended up with the Book of Mormon. And on the front of the Book of Mormon, it literally says another testament of Jesus Christ. Well, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now the Mormon church says this is another one. And what is the word here in Galatians? Another gospel. So it's another gospel in book form delivered by an angel. It qualifies under the curse of Galatians chapter 1. Paul said it was accursed and they're right. So let me show you a little bit about Mormon doctrine on salvation. This is from their official website. Here's a quote from the book of Mosiah. That's made up. That's like a cross between Moses and Josiah. So whoever made that up, made up just Mosiah. Sounds right. So it's in the Book of Mormon. For salvation cometh to none, except it be through repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mosiah 3.12. Then 2 Nephi 25 says, It is not repentance per se that saves man. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us. It is not by our sincere and honest change of behavior alone alone that we are saved but by grace that we are saved after all we can do boom there's your false gospel right there in other words the real gospel applies forgiveness before you do anything because remember when did god write your name in the book of life the day you got saved 
No, before the foundation of the world. That's when it was written down. And God tells us that in the story of Jacob and Esau. If you remember, before Jacob and Esau were born in the womb, God had already selected Jacob. And the book of Hebrews tells us that that was God signifying that before any of them did any works, God had already chosen the one that he was going to have the bloodline come through. And it was Jacob, not Esau. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So before the works, God saves. Before you could do any good, what does the Bible say? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when you add the phrase, by grace are we saved, after all we can do, you're saying you must do the works first, then the law, then the grace will be applied. So, our two hot dog stands. The billionaire who's given away the hot dogs, what does he require in order for you to get a hot dog? Well, you do have to show up. Because he's not going to go around shoving hot dogs down everybody's throat. Neither are we. Neither is God. But he does say, ask, and it shall be given. Given is the key. Given. It's a gift. So the people go up, my children, we have nothing to eat today. And we don't have this guy's $20. Take all the hot dogs you want. Come back tomorrow. I'll have plenty more. Isn't that how it is? When you pray in the morning, do you pray after you've done a bunch of stuff or do you pray before you've done anything? Pray before you do anything. God's grace is already there. It's already it's waiting on you when you woke up out of bed this morning. Okay? So after all we can do. True repentance, however, is the condition required so that God's forgiveness can come into our lives. And that he's going to define what he means by repentance. True repentance brings us back to doing what is right. To truly repent, we must recognize our sins and feel remorse or godly sorrow and confess those sins to God. If our sins are serious, we must also confess them to our authorized priesthood leader. Now, who gets to decide what is serious? I f almost fell out of my chair when Bradley told me this. Before Bradley got saved, he come over here one Sunday morning early. I had, I had got him to listen to me. And he came over one Sunday morning. And he said that, you know, there a while back when he was in the Mormon church, he had a girlfriend and he got in a little trouble. And he said, I had to go tell my bishop. I went, what? He said, yeah, we have to confess to our bishop in the Mormon church. And I looked right, the Holy Ghost was saying, Mike, say this, Mike, say this. And I looked at him and I said, Bradley, I guarantee you, you didn't tell him everything, did you? And he looked me in the eye and I looked at him in the eye and he said, no. I said, tell me why you didn't tell him everything. He said, because I was afraid. I said, that's right. And yet the Bible says, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. I said, you can't tell that man what you really did, but you can tell God and you know it. He got saved not too long after that. God was working in that man's heart. This stuff makes me angry. I don't know if it does you, but it just boils me. Okay? Because you remember back in the 90s when the Promise Keepers movement was going through everything. I don't know if they're still around or not. They were get, but it started out, I guess, as a good organization. But immediately, immediately, with all this big money being poured into it, they started having to bring in Roman Catholics. Then they had to start recognizing Mormons as being fellow brethren. So, I mean, it turned into, very quickly, it turned into this ecumenical box that everybody was all the same and all this stuff. I mean, very quickly it got corrupt, okay? Because the people selling the hot dogs don't like the people giving them away. And if you look at the history of the Christian church, the Bible Christian church, it has always been persecuted by those who sell. Always. So, 
If our sins are serious, we must also confess them to our authorized priesthood leader. We need to ask God for forgiveness and do all we can to correct whatever harm our actions may have caused. Show me that in the Bible. Repentance means a change of mind and heart. We stop doing things that, that are wrong and we start doing things that are right. It brings us a fresh attitude toward God, oneself, and life in general. But I'm not done. Same website says, The Lord said, He that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. That's from the Doctrine and Covenants. There's, see, there's the Book of Mormon. That's what Joe Smith said the angel gave to him. And then when they, when they formed the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with Joe Smith as its Pope, Chief Apostle, Joseph Smith started getting all of these revelations from God after that. So he wrote a book called The Pearl of Great Price and another one called The Doctrine and Covenants. And as when Joe Smith died off, Brigham Young came in and took his place. Brigham Young also added to The Doctrine and Covenants. So here's, here's, the, here's where the Mormons really get their doctrine. They say they use the King James Bible. Not so much. They base a lot of it from the Book of Mormon and then what they don't find in the Book of Mormon they find in the Doctrine and Covenants because as each apostle, chief apostle of... See, they have a chief apostle and a quorum of 12 to match Jesus and the disciples. So the chief apostle of the Mormon church, the chief prophet or whatever they call him, while he's in his office, if he gets any fresh revelation from God then that goes into the doctrines of the Mormon church, and that's their official belief. So, therefore, while they, they preached polygamy, and the United States government said, that's immoral. So they said, they outlawed polygamy, and they said, you cannot do that. So then, the whatever, whatever apostle or bishop or whatever was in charge then said, we got a revelation from God, God says he doesn't use the practice of polygamy anymore. And even there for a while, early on, the Mormon church, because God gave Joseph Smith a revelation that said that when the war was in heaven and Satan and all of his devils fought against Michael and his angels, that Satan was cast to the ground and God took all the angels that fought on Satan's side, darkened their skin, kinked their hair up, and sent them down to the earth as black people. Truth. But they've had to go back and change that. So they got a new revelation from God that that's, you know, we still love black people. Makes me sick. So Doctrine and Covenant says, He that re repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven, which is not true. And he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Now what does that tell See, that verse contradicts what he just said. The burden and heavy work that we're doing is in sin. When we come to Christ, he gives us rest from that. Be faithful and diligent. I will encircle thee in the armies of my love. That's from the Doctrine and Covenants. So here's another statement from the Doctrine and Covenants. The Lord has said that he cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Now, you'll not find that anywhere in the King James Bible. Sin results in the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when you sin, Sterling, God pulls his Holy Spirit away from you. Now you have no Holy Spirit. You die in that condition, where are you going? You go to hell. Okay? But see, it's not true, is it? When we sin, what does the Holy Spirit do? Beats the daylights out of us. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead. The Holy Spirit kicks in gear. Okay? So, sin results in the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit. Sin dulls the conscience and makes repentance difficult. Because sin causes people to substitute rationalizations for godly regret. It makes the one who sins unable to dwell in the presence of Heavenly Father, for no unclean thing can dwell with God. That's 1 Nephi 10.21. That's not in the Bible. It's the Book of Mormon. Again, another made-up word, Mosiah. For behold, and also his blood atoneth for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam, who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them, who have ignorantly sinned. This is setting up... Baptism for the dead. Serious transgressions, such as violations of the law of chastity, 
may jeopardize a person's membership in the Mormon church. Therefore, such sins need to be confessed both to the Lord and his priesthood representatives in the church. Now, can you imagine what kind of power games those guys play? Because I, I believe there's some really stupid Mormons who actually do tell that bishop everything they do. And that guy knows all their dirty sins. There's a book I encourage you to read. You can get it. You can get free copy from Google Books called The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional. It's written by Charles Chiniqui. He was a Roman Catholic priest from French Canada back in the 1800s. Charles Chiniqui basically opened the doors to what the confessional was really all about. And I won't even, I won't even talk about what's in that book. But I can tell you, all these Catholic priests that got after all these boys, that started in the confessional. Those priests started working those boys up in the confessional. Same thing happens in the Mormon church. Same thing. This is done under the care of a bishop or branch president and possibly a stake or mission president who serve as watchmen and judges in the church. While only the Lord can forgive sins, these priesthood leaders play a critical role in the process of repentance. They will keep confessions confidential and help throughout the process of repentance. Do you really believe that? Mormon beliefs. Abandonment of sin. Although confession... Now, get this one. Although confession is an essential element of repentance, it is not enough. The Lord has said, by this ye may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess them and forsake them. Again, doctrine and covenants, not the Bible. We must maintain an unyielding, permanent resolve that we will never repeat the transgression. Now, who in here has ever repeated a transgression? Of course you have. I don't know of anybody that hasn't. So they say, uh, let's see, when we keep this commitment, we will never experience the pain of that sin again. We must flee immediately from any compromising situation. If a certain situation causes us to sin or may cause us to sin, we must leave. We cannot linger in temptation and expect to overcome sin. So they say, it is not enough to simply try to resist evil or empty our lives of sin. We must listen to the emphasis on personal works. We must, we must, we have to do this. We must fill our lives with righteousness and engage in activities that bring spiritual power. We must immerse ourselves in the scripture and pray daily for the Lord to give us strength beyond our own. At times we should fast for special blessings. Full obedience brings the complete power of the gospel into our lives, including increased strength to overcome our weaknesses. This obedience includes actions we might not initially consider part of repentance, such as attending meetings, paying tithing, money, money. Give us the money and you won't want to sin anymore. Did you hear that? Send us the money. You must buy the hot dog and you must keep buying the hot dog. Paying tithing, giving service, and forgiving others. The Lord promised, He that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. Doctrine and covenants. Now, listen to this one. On the same basis, men cannot be saved in their sins. Alma 11.37. What, where is Alma? What, where is that at in the Bible? It's not. The Lord has ordained the laws by which salvation and all good things come, and until obedience prepares the way, the promised blessings are withheld. Again, doctrine and covenants, doctrine and covenants, doctrine and covenants. Men can no more be saved without obedience than they can be healed without faith. All things operate by law. Did you hear that? That's the, law keeping is the first covenant, which we broke. 
that covenant is done away in Christ. If salvation, and Paul makes it clear in Galatians, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Which was it? All things operate by law. Blessings result from obedience to law and are withheld when there is no obedience. This is BYU professor Daniel Ludlow, blah, blah, blah. The 13th president of the Mormon church, Ezra Taft Benson, said, What is meant by, quote, after all we can do? After all we can do includes extending our best effort. After all we can do includes living his commandments. After all we can do includes loving our fellow men and praying for those who regard us as their adversary. After all we can do means clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, and giving succor to those who stand in need of our succor. Mosiah 4.15 Remembering that what we do unto one of the least of God's children, we do unto him. So he brings in Matthew 25, but then he references doctrine and covenants again. After all we can do means leading chaste, clean, pure lives, being scrupulously honest in all our dealings and treating others the way we would want to be treated, the teachings of Ezra Taft Benson. But then he says, but all these blessings are ours on one condition. And this is spoken of by Nephi, Book of Mormon, when he said, for we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, but mark you this condition after all we can do. And I want, let's see here. Man, I got too much here. I didn't get into the bad part yet. I not got there yet. I tried to, but I'm not there yet. Because there is a more hellish doctrine on salvation that the Mormons teach, but so does Finnis Dake. It says the same thing, and I'll show you that next Sunday morning. Two hot dog stands. And you have no money. Which one will you go to? The free one. The free one. Some people, they got money. They have good works on the outside. So they're content with religions like that. But I had nothing. When I came to Christ, I had nothing. The old rugged cross, uh, no, the, what is that song? Rock of Ages? Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I didn't bring anything to Christ, nothing. But I came away with everything. That's the real gospel. Amen? Father, you know what's going on. You know the powers that are against us. You know, Lord, the very dark, evil things that have befallen us. You know the works of hatred and envy that are being done right now. Father, this church is yours. These people are yours. The ministry is yours. The radio station is yours. If you see fit to continue its operation, then the gates of hell itself cannot stand against it. This church is yours. If you see fit to continue to work in this church, then all the power of the enemy cannot prevail against it. Not in the least bit. So Father, I commend my mouth, my heart, my hands, and this church, and everything that you're doing in it, I commend that into your hands. It's yours. And you'll bless it, or you'll shut it down. It's up to you. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you once again. Our hearts, our minds, our mouths, our lives, 
Every action we commend to you. And we ask for your grace. Father, remind us that what we do for you is not in payment or in expectation of blessings to receive. We've already received the blessings. And Father, help us to always stand for the free gospel against all who would try to pervert it. We ask this blessing in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.